be a man short story dot doc to the choice. We'll see if that title sticks. I thought that I knew the place that I was from, where I grew up, but as I returned to that property, I could see how time had shifted my perspective. I touched the grass, felt the early morning dew. I looked up at the house that I once lived in and I saw my past. Once upon a time, I was a boy. In the morning, my father would come into my room. He would grab hold of my slender ankle protruding from the thin quilt that my mom had made for me when I was an even smaller boy. And with a flick of, her arm, with, of his arm, would jerk me out of bed. Coming awake while in motion, I would cling to my mother's quilt the way I clung to my memories of her. Chores, he would say. Sometimes he would give a snort of laughter. Then he'd walk down to the kitchen and pour himself a cup of coffee. Another vestige of my mother's memory, King, our cat, would hiss accusingly at my father from the outskirts of the kitchen as I would prepare our breakfast. A little shit, my father would grumble in return. Sometimes my father would throw things at King when there was a projectile handy, assuring that the hostility was mutual. It was hard without my mother. She left without any word. One morning my father yanked me awake, the first morning he did so, and told me she was gone. He instructed me in the duties that had been passed from her to me. I was seven then, now I'm 12. From the outs outside, everything looked fine. My dad was a manager at the factory. He would wear a button-up shirt with short sleeves and a tie or a clean press polo. He kept his hair neatly trimmed and was well-mannered and presentable when he went out. Most days, he worked normal people hours. Sometimes he worked the overnights. I had nice enough stuff, new clothes and kicks at the beginning of the school year, video games and comic books. I did well in school. I did draw attention. Nights that he didn't work, he could, be, he could be found a case of beer deep on the couch watching ESPN or some old war movie. Sometimes he'd cool off, that's what he called it, cooling off, at the bowling alley before he came home. On the nights that he wasn't cooling off at the bowling alley or working, I was expected to have dinner ready for him when he got home. This didn't leave any time for activities after school. We lived far enough outside of town that if I missed the bus, the walk home would mean that I was late preparing dinner and was due for an attitude adjustment. Whenever I got on my dad's bad side, I would get an attitude adjustment. Most of the time, I did draw attention and was just fine, but sometimes it didn't matter what I did. I was going to get an attitude adjustment on behalf of one of those other chuckleheads, that's what he called them, at work or in town. I shared the same term of endearment as King, little shit. He almost never left a mark. I was too far away from most of the kids to play, but sometimes Patrick would hop on his bike and meet me down the road for a while. He never came to my house. My father scared him. Other times, I would just wander around our property, the distance that separated mine, me from other kids, but it gave me a huge backyard. The backside of our property butted up against county forest land, so there was plenty of places to disappear. This was my life until the night of the shooting star. You hear about them, but to see one was different. To have one fall close enough to feel it, that was really different. I don't remember if I made a wish. I wasn't asleep when it happened. My father had just passed out on the couch, the television still on it, a half full can of beer warming in his hand. My bedroom window opened onto the roof, so I had crawled out there to look at the stars between the gathering thunderheads and enjoy the cool spring air. The sky lit up as it fell. Across the starry night it was a street, but when it entered the clouds, it looked like someone had flipped on the floodlights. It glowed so brightly. I traced its path with my wide eyes into the thick of trees behind our house. When it hit the woods, I nearly tumbled from the roof from the concussion it caused. There was fire, but the wood, still damp from the snow melt, didn't go up. The crash had shook my father awake, covering him in that half-finished beer. Of course, that made him angry, so he stormed off in the direction of the fires. He hadn't seen the star fall, so he had no idea what he was storming towards. He didn't come home that night. I woke up in the morning and found myself alone. I got myself ready for school. I left the empty house and caught my bus. I assumed that it was a meteorite of some sort, and I couldn't wait to get home to investigate the burn area for whatever remained. The fires were still burning in some spots, like a multitude of campfires. The ground was blackened and the trees scorched. It was all quiet. I could hear my, all I could hear was my clomping around. I followed the broken branches and fallen trees and found the hole. The mound of dirt around it was huge, like a hill had suddenly exploded into being, which was sort of what happened. The hole had bore into the ground at an angled descent, and was deep enough that I couldn't see the back in the, dark, in the darkness inside. I wished that I had a flashlight with me. It was large enough that I wouldn't have to crouch to explore it. I stood there for a while, transfixed by the hole. I was desperate to explore it, but the absence of light inside was enough to keep me out. 
I could hear the steady beat of my heart to the stillness of the woods. I was just thinking how it was strange that I couldn't hear any sound in the sounds of animals in the woods when a sharp snap of a stick jerked me back into the present. Adrenaline flooded my system as my heart thumped. My head twisted in the direction of the snap, and I saw something that I was not prepared for. My father. He was dirty, still wearing the clothes he'd been in the night before. My first thought ran to my predicament. Could I be in trouble? That thought was swiftly replaced by another. Worry. He appeared confused. I called out to him. Dad? He turned his head in my direction. I didn't see any recognition on his face. Dad? I said again. You all right? Uh, I'm fine, he said. I, where am I? You're in the woods, Dad. There was a shooting star last night. Crashed right here. Uh, haven't you been home? Did you hurt yourself? I, I must have, he said. Help me back home. So I did. I led him by the hand back to the house. He stumbled a few times. When I glanced back, I could see that it was because he was looking around, up and around, studying the trees around him like it was the first time he saw he had seen them. When we got back to the house, I started the shower for him and left him to clean up. He was in the bathroom for a while before he'd finished. He put on the clothes that I left at the door for him, and then he came out to the living room. I debated whether or not to get him a beer. He might demand one now, but if he'd hurt his head, that would be the last thing he should have. I decided to wait. When he came out, I asked him if I could get him anything. I'm fine, he said, and he sat down. He didn't appear to have any head wounds, at least not any that I could see from a distance. His skin seemed a little tight around his forehead, which might indicate some swelling. The skin seemed a little loose under his ear, near his hairline. I couldn't quite see if there was a gash, but there wasn't any blood, so I wasn't sure what to do except stand there dumbly. Then the cat hopped up on his lap. My heart damn near stopped. The cat looked at my dad, looked deep into his eyes. My dad just looked back, head cocked a little to the side. They sat there like that for the longest minute of my life, and then King began purring. The cat who subsisted on whatever food I gave him and the spite that it had for my dad was sitting on his lap and purring. Over the next couple of weeks, things got stranger. <coughs> By all accounts, my dad was normal. He got up, went to his work, and came home. Everything appeared normal, but then that's what we did. Ever since Mom disappeared, we appeared up normal outside. Inside, when we were home, that was when the facade lifted. The collared shirts came off, and the beer came out. But there was no beer, and there was no attitude adjustments. Everything about my dad had softened. I didn't trust it. I skirted around the edges like King used to, waiting for things to return to normal and catch the back of a hand or the edge of a belt. But it never came. Every once in a while, he'd ask a strange question about something obvious, or the slight haziness of that day would return. But then it would go away, and he'd appear just as he'd uh, sharp again. One night, three weeks after the shooting star, I heard a door click shut. I crept over to my window, and I saw my dad in the backyard walking out towards the woods. I pulled some clothes on, and I followed, grabbing a flashlight this time. I kept my distance, and it didn't appear as if my dad knew that I was following him. I noticed that the path that we were taking to the hole was not well worn. He'd been making this trip a lot. The site hadn't changed. Nothing new had grown in the areas where the fire had burned, so I crouched at the edge behind a fallen tree. It was a clear night, so I had no trouble seeing him in the opening next to the dirt hill, next to the hole. His body posture seemed weary, a little slumped over. What are you doing? I whispered to myself. Barely a breath came from my mouth. My dad's head perked up and looked around. I crouched lower my eyes barely cresting the tree. He stood for a moment longer and then ducked into the hole. I waited a long time. Minutes felt like hours. My sweaty palm gripped the handle of my flashlight tightly, as if it were a totem that could protect me. My father didn't come out of the hole, so I moved toward it. I crouched low to the ground, my knees bent, my fingertips tucked, glancing off the surface of the dirt. There was no cover out here, so my plan was to hug the ground and pray that I appeared invisible. I ran to no interference on my trip to the hole, and now I had to decide if I was going to follow him in. I could see no light coming from inside. I had no idea how deep it really went. I took a breath and I went inside. I kept the flashlight off at first, choosing instead to hug the side. It wasn't until I'd been moving for a few minutes that I realized that the hole had remained the same diameter as it was at the entrance. I took a deep breath and I pressed the button on the side of the flashlight. Whatever had fallen from the sky had burrowed into the ground and crashed into an underground cave right beneath. 
I shine the light back the way I come in and found my footprints on the ground. Next to them, I found the ground to be well pressed, probably my dad's continued trips in and out of the cave. I followed the trail with my flashlight and I continued in the direction that they led. I went deeper and then I heard voices. I flipped off my flashlight immediately and instinctually crouched. I couldn't quite hear what the voices were saying. The content wasn't the first thing on my mind, though. No, that would be the fact that I followed one person in the hole and there were two voices. I moved forward slowly. The voices became clear. Perhaps I turned wrong. I could hear my dad's voice, calm and questioning, followed by my dad speaking rougher, angrier. I stopped when it felt like I was right on top of the voices in the dark. In a calm voice, my father was asking questions, the same or similar questions that he'd been asking me. The responses in the gruff voice were dismissive and filled with swearing. Then I heard a question that stopped my breath cold. Why do you hurt your son? The calm voice asked. Fuck you, the gruff voice responded. Let me up and I'll show you. You scare him, the calm voice said. The boy should be afraid of his father, respect him. Are they the same thing? I am teaching him how to be a man. Where's his mother? She's gone. Gone? Out of the picture. Why? The attitude on that one. The gruff voice came up. It was quiet for a while. I worry about him. I couldn't tell which voice that was. In the years that followed, I wish that I could take back what I did next. There are some things that once you see them will burn clearly into your brain forever. In the moment, though, I just took a deep breath and I turned on the flashlight. It lit up my father's face. He was crouched ahead of me and, unprepared to suddenly have a light in his face, drew his arm up to cover his eyes. Who the fuck is that, I heard my father say. But I didn't see his lips move. I turned my light to the voice, to the left of where I saw my father crouching. There on the floor was a man my father's size. His hands and feet were encased in some substance that was milky white and shimmered a little in the light. He had no skin anywhere on his body. I'd seen pictures of that bodywork science display that showed people without their skin on, and he looked like that. Not slimy like an hell razor, but like he'd been sealed in plastic wrapping after his skin had been removed. This meant, to my horror, that my father, the father I'd been living with, was something wearing my dad like a suit of clothes. Is that you, you little shit? The skinless dad yelled. What are you waiting for? Get me out of here. I started to move toward him, and then the thing in my dad's suit did the same. I jerked back and pointed my flashlight at him and saw that he had something in his hands, a wand of some sort. He held it against the resin that was binding my dad's feet and the solid mass turned to liquid and spilled to the ground. He did the same with the resin on my dad's hands. My dad shoved him then. The dad's suit tripped backwards and fell on his butt. My dad kicked him twice and when he saw that the dad's suit wasn't resisting him, he turned to me. Why didn't you come looking for me sooner? I didn't have a good answer to give him. Are you all right? I asked. I'm pissed, he said. Your skin, I mean, yeah. He noticed that. He noticed that his skin was missing. His hands went to his arms, his chest, his face. He felt between his legs. He let out a cry of anguish. What did he do to me, he screamed. And then he came at me. I'm not sure why, but I quickly had to pull myself into a ball to fend off his attack. Then as suddenly as it had started, it was over. The dad suit had knocked into him, and he was sprawled out on the cave floor. Be a man, my dad spit at me. I think he expected me to charge the thing wearing his skin. He didn't say it. He didn't say anything. Instead, he let out a cry and charged at the thing in the dad's suit. He moved to the side and my dad hit the wall. He hit at an angle and I heard a snap. I went to him, his head lolling to the side of his twisted body. There was a soft gurgling sound and then nothing. I looked at the thing in the dad's suit. It was looking down the dark corridor. Be a man, he whispered. They looked at me. He came over and helped me to my feet and put a sturdier arm around my shoulders. Be a man. My new father raised me. I had the benefits of having an adopted dad who appeared to everyone as my original. No one knew what my dad had been like to me, so no one knew that this one was different. It didn't matter. We decided to move a year later, picking out a place that seemed nice for a television show and going there. Something had always nagged at me about that night, though, and now I stood in the cave in the same spot where that other man the one who had donated his DNA to my mother on a drunken night, but had never earned the title of father, had died and was buried. My flashlight drifted toward that tunnel that my father had looked down so many years before. I walked in the direction of that long ago play, glance. I found the vessel, a ship, that had brought him into my life. 
My hands caressed its smooth surface, some sort of metal, I assumed, though it appeared like a blue-gray version of that resin he'd used. I found a panel on the side that slid open when I touched it to reveal a latch. When I pulled the latch, the door appeared and the ship roared to life. It all appeared to work. I didn't dare step inside for fear of causing it to take off by mistake. I pressed against the latch and the whole thing closed up again. He could have left that night. I think he intended to. Intended to give my birth father back his skin and then leave. But then, after he died, my father chose to stay for me. He chose to raise me and spend the rest of his life on my planet so that I would be okay. Be a man. Someday I'll come back. I'll get to the ship and find out where my father came from. But first, I have to follow his example. My girlfriend is pregnant. My child needs a father. Thank you.